Hello everyone, welcome to Leathertainment Podcast. I'm your host, Tanner Ledestein. Today we have Tom from Olive and Leather from Germany. And we're going to discuss a new tanning technique. Um, I'm not sure how new it is, but it is definitely unique and new to me. I just got learned about it. I started to see some of the letters made with it. I'm experimenting with them. And it's quite exciting, actually. And we're going to learn from Tom, who is in, in the organization, who invented the technique. And now they're managing spreading this technology um, to the world. So, Tom, welcome. Thanks for spending the time with us here and informing us about this new tanning technique. We can start by getting to know you a little bit. Why don't you introduce yourself and your story of getting into leather and tanning business? Yes, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a real pleasure meeting you. And um, it's always great to see how, how you're explaining to the to the audience all about leather and how something is made. And so that's really great to, to have the chance. Yeah, and um, my name is Thomas, um, Thomas Lamparter. I'm at White Green, happy to, to spread leaven leather to the world. And I actually grew up in a tannery, my grandfather being a tanner, my father being a tanner, and actually goes much further back. So there used to be some batch tanners in the past, um, white tanners, um, how they were called, which were the aluminium tanners. Um, and my, my grandfather in ninth, my father in tenth generation, were running a tannery for glacé leather, so the so-called chevro, which is maybe even known to you. Um, so based on the goat skins, um, very more the shiny compact leathers um, for the typical um, ladies' pumps, a type of leather which is today not common anymore and the tannery no longer exists. But nevertheless, I, I remained in the industry. I mean, having grown up in a tannery, helping on the weekends and jumping around there, um, which was kind of a, a playground, not really playground, but kind of get to know it and um, kind of get addicted to this kind of subject, of course. You know? And during, when I was young at school, I needed some money. I started working at a shoe shop. So for a couple of years, starting at about 15, um, I was El Bundy for a couple of years, um, which is also one of the reasons why I actually I love shoes. I've got more shoes than my wife and appreciate very much basically how yeah, well-made products, well-made products of leather and especially shoes, I must say. And yeah, so kind of this is how I got into the industry and when I, a couple of years ago, um, kind of the, the technology was very new um, for Oliven Leder. I said, okay, actually, this is the logic next step for the industry, and I want to be part of that. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. I can relate to that background a lot. I think it is a playground for a kid who has a little bit interest in leather or chemistry. It is a playground. It's, it's a messy and stinky one, but once you get into it, uh, it becomes very engaging. And yes, it is addictive once you get in. It is hard to get out. Like it just, it doesn't leave you. You, you just come, come back to it somehow, even if you try to escape. That's what happened Absolutely. to me. Uh, but that's awesome. And this next logical step in in tanning, and as far as I learned from you so far and uh, my research, it does seem very promising. So, how do you? introduce us this olive leaf tanning technology what you guys call wet green right now how it works when and where it was born was it, is it a super new invention or was it out there but not perfected like just give us the general story of it and and what it is how it is yeah so i'm very fortunate to be working with one of the inventors um stefan banaschak uh, my colleague he's basically a a walking leather encyclopedia. He's all into leather. Also, he's got a long family background with leather. Um, he used to basically he not only be a tanning master and a leather technician, but also later at the German tanner school, educate the leather technicians from all over the world coming to Reutlingen, where we are based today as well, um, to teach them about all about leather. You know? And... Basically, during his time there with, with the other colleagues, 
um, who invented the technology basically together with him. Um, they were always in the search for an alternative to the conventional tanning. They always saw basically the, the classical tanning systems. The most common one, of course, is the chrome tanning or what many people know maybe as the wet blue when the hide gets tanned. It looks after the tanning bluish because of the tanning agent um, or the chrome free tanned leathers, the so-called wet white because they have got, let's say, more whitish creamish look. Um, but they said, okay, all those chemistries, there must be something more sustainable out there, scalable in a mass production um, coming somewhere from nature. Of course, if you then look to vegetable tanning as a maybe logic next step, well, why is it only a small part of the industry? Because it used to be mainly veg tanned, but there's also, of course, a shortcut on, on availability. Yeah? And of course, the, the type of articles you can make is maybe more like, let's say, the classical leather shoe sole. Yeah, it's a more stiff body leather and not something nice, a nice soft napa type, let's say, for a jacket or so. Um, <clears throat> and at some point, they, they discovered together with some, some biotech guys, hey, all, all the, the real working anti-aging creams actually have got one thing in common. They contain oliropein. So the healthy part, if you look to, let's say, all your extra virginias are the high, highest grade of olive oil, what makes the olive itself and the olive oil so healthy is the oliropein. So this magic molecule by nature actually enables for the very first time to do a cross-linking of the natural skin fiber structure, meaning it actually connecting the fibers together, it enables for the first time to, do, to make a soft vegetable tent leather. And in the past, in order to do that, instead of the chrome tan, they would use the synthetic chrome tanning agents like a glutaraldehyde, for example, which is highly toxic stuff. Yeah? So um, you would never dare eating it, for example. Yeah? We'll get to that maybe later. Um, so they found, okay, by nature, in, in, in the byproducts from olive growing, so whether it's the olive leaves, it can be the pomace or the filter cake from, from pressing or... Um, the olive itself um, for the olive oil and even the olive mill waste water. So, so, so the, the black water coming out of the, in the end after the washing um, all contain this oliropein. So they filed for a patent. It's globally patented um, to use the byproducts of olive growing. Of course, not using the older extra virginia, it would be competing with food. It could also be used, but it doesn't make sense. Um, but to use those byproducts of olive growing to actually tan a byproduct, the, the skin, which is anyways available as long as the people eat meat. Um, and when they discovered that, that saying, okay, actually these anti-aging shields, if they really work on the, on the human skin, it must also work for the tanning. And then it was especially down to Stefan to find a way how we can really make it work um, and once they saw it works, of course, they patented it. And after introducing to a couple of companies like BMW, they said, okay, this is what we want to have. We've got a new car coming up, like everybody knows. For example, the i3 then was the first car to have a leaving. They said, okay, let's, let's start a company. So it actually is a new technology, coming back to that point. Um, because if you look to, let's say, in olive leaves, olive leaves are very hard. You have the feeling it's like a wax or so on top. It's not, but it's very hard. It's difficult to decompose. And if you would put that into a pit, like a classical batch tanning would normally be, it would take ages and not much would be happening. So you actually have to cut it. And, and then through this extraction process, what um, the colleagues developed, found a way to concentrate it and then use it. I see. So the, the great thing I heard there is the, the byproduct of the olive, olive oil industry is making another upcycled item here, like leather itself, as you said. As long as we eat meat, leather is the waste there, leather goes to tannery. Now it's being tanned using another upcycled material from another food industry. Is, it sounds pretty cool to me. Like it just makes leather much, much, much more sustainable and full circle, you know, into upcycle and circular economy. So another key point I caught there, you said cross linker, it's just to give some perspective to the audience, you know, this is a technical term in, in the tanning, 
Cross-linking is basically the, one of the ways leather can be tanned, the leather fibers, uh, the collagen fibers link to each other so bacteria cannot eat them anymore. So leather is a stable format after that point. I'm right, right, at this, until this point. So Chrome does it pretty well and it, uh, Chrome does that cross-linking tanning uh, methodology and gives you soft leather because of this. But vegetable tanning, the traditional vegetable tanning doesn't do this cross-linking. It just basically fills every gap between the fibers, not leaving any room for the bacteria to go in and eat and putrefy the leather anymore. Another way of protecting leather forever, almost forever. But that results in a stiff leather that, that doesn't soften like the chrome one. So basically, this is a vegetable tanning technique that acts like chrome with the cross-linking methodology gives us a soft leather first time when you use vegetable tanning. That's right? Yeah, and actually it's, well, technically it much more, especially this cross-linking is c coming from the synthetic tannins, what you then know, like glutaraldehyde. Mm -hmm. um, and you're absolutely right how you explained this, this cross-linking. Um, the gift by nature actually is we've got the two binding mechanisms. Like you said, we've got the filling component from the classical, from the phenols, from the, the plants. Mm -hmm. So there is some filling, but it's rather small. And some other plants have got a much stronger filling, like let's say a chestnut or quebracho. Quebracho. Or such, yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and plus, and that is especially then what we are trying to extract with our patent, um, is this oleropein, this natural cross-linker. So we've got two binding mechanisms by nature. Um, but the, the one we're mainly focusing on is this cross-linker. And that's why it's possible for the first time to make a soft vegetable tent leather. Okay, that's that's really exciting. And, um, you know, I learned this from you uh, a month ago once we first talked. And then since then, from the context you introduced me, uh, some tanneries using this technology start sending me some samples. I'm I'm excited. Uh, I'm waiting for my full skin samples out of these things so far. And yes, they feel like, you know, chrome tan leathers. This this doesn't happen with normal vegetable tan leathers. I'm I'm quite impressed. There's very very cool articles um, they they have done using using your technique. So to to that point, a little extending on that, can any tannery start making leather using this technique, or how does it work now? Can you switch from Chrome like tomorrow if you want to? Basically, if you want to, yes. Um, in order to protect the consumer and the Oliven Leather community, we've got a, a couple obstacles in there because we say we want to be sure that if for a product being named Oliven Leather or the leather being named Oliven Leather, which is a globally registered trademark, um, which companies working with us, like for example, Hugo Boss, are actively using to communicate the specialty to their customers. Um, we've got two points in there. A tannery has to sign a contract with us in which they commit themselves to keep Oliven Leder free from a cross-contamination. Cross-contamination meaning, for example, heavy metals like chromium, zeolite, other metals um, not only in the tanning but also in the steps like re-tanning and especially also dyeing because many dye stuffs contain heavy metals like Metal, yeah. um, nickel may maybe be okay but especially then um, other chemicals rather difficult heavy metals which shouldn't be in there in our opinion um, so they have to assure us to do that, to follow those rules, so they are willing to do it. Also, they need a certain minimum amount to really have enough in the skin to not have to contaminate, for example, with the glutaraldehydes or synthetic tanning chemicals, which would otherwise have to be used. So we specify a certain minimum amount. So once they have committed themselves to do that, that's step one, we then also go into the tanneries and audit them between saying yes we are willing to do it and we will do it and actually physically being capable of doing it 
can also be two different points because we've been to tanneries, whether it's in Germany, in, in Italy, in India, it doesn't matter. Um, we weren't able to, to do it. Quite simple. If, if, for example, a tannery has been producing chrome tanned leather and wooden drums for the last, let's say, 60 years, um, there will be so much chromium absorbed into, into the wood in the meanwhile that whatever they do to clean and wash, there will always be some chrome released and you will at the end find chromium in the olivin leather, which of course nobody wants to have. Um, so there we, we support them, those tanneries, to actually show which are the steps where they have to take a special care. Um, but most modern tanneries, I would say, who anyways have got either modern wooden drums or quite new wooden drums, which are not spongy inside, um, should be fine. I mean, we've got many partners that are producing already two different lines. Normally they're producing chrome tanned leather, which is the most common. They're producing some synthetic chrome-free tanned leather. Um, and then with the leaven later, they would bring in a third line. So, but always using the same drums normally. So they already are used to certain washing because also in the chrome-free tanned leathers, you don't want to find chromium. So there it's fairly easy. <clears throat> um, but if they are willing to do it, if they've got some modern drums, so either modern wooden drums, polypropylene drums, stainless steel drums, it should be absolutely fine. And so then it would be theoretically possible to introduce, yes. Okay, that's perfect. And what is it different? How does it compare to that other techniques, either chrome or typical vegetable tanning in terms of economical impact, efficiency and environmental aspect of tanning from a tannery standpoint like why would the tannery want to go this way like how does it compare is it a lot more expensive it's comparable it's cheaper well so far of course as any new technology in the beginning it's more expensive until you get to a certain economy of scale plus we start it's cradle cradle gold certified the tanning agent meaning for this and complete um, supply chain everything has been audited from the very beginning, we're already on the plantations where the people are collecting the leaves. So then when they do the pruning of the trees or shaking the, the olive trees, leaves fall down. Those have to be separated, dried and shipped to us. So of course, as soon as somebody does that, instead of simply burning it, you have to pay them, otherwise nobody will do it. And we want to, of course, make sure that the people are paid fair wages. They must be able to make a living of it if they do it. Um, so it's not comparable to, let's say, a crow mine somewhere. You have got a mine, everybody can imagine a little bit diff difficult circumstances there. Or you've got somewhere where there's an oil rig or fracking with all the environmental impact of such technologies and coming out of that for the synthetic tanning agents like glutaraldehyde. Um, so there's a, a difference there from the very beginning. Um, but then for looking into the actual tannery, Technically, how it works, it's much more similar like a, a synthetic chrome-free tanning. Um, I always say it's the vegetable way, way of chrome-free tanning, how it reacts, or synthetic way, uh, the vegetable way of um, metal-free tanning. And the introduction to the tanneries, if they are modern and already used to working with such technologies, um, they normally already have, for example, wastewater treatment plants, which are specialized in, in treating non-metal tanning systems. Um, and there comes in a, a big advantage. So com compared to chrome tanning, we need to have a chrome recycling, all that, of course, to avoid the contamination later on. And in many countries, if you look to India and so on with the zero discharge uh, regulations, they're not allowed to send back any wastewater. If in Europe, it's different. If you've got a special wastewater treatment plant, you may be allowed, if you achieve certain measures, to release the water later back to the river. Um, the time it needs in a tannery to produce or even later compared to chrome tanned leather or especially chrome free tanned leather um, is comparable. It's not like a vegetable tanned leather, which is, normally takes much longer. So it's our technology works similar like chrome-free tanning or metal-free tanning. Um, 
and therefore energy consumption is comparable water consumption but actually water consumption is not the right term because with a leaven later you can say you're only borrowing the, the water also for a classical vegetable tanning you can say you only borrow the water so if you've got a, a, a kind of a modern tannery you could take the water from the river you clean it a bit you use it in tanning you clean it in your biological wastewater treatment plant and you can release it back to the river so i only borrow it for the time you produce the leather and of course some some water remains in the leather yeah but other than that you would not have any water consumption so the the typical point what what people try to use against leather say ah oh, they need so much water if a tannery is modern and has got a good biological wastewater treatment plant there's no water consumption so looking at those points of course the industry i think is not really ready yet to use all these advantages but the, the i think we're getting closer and closer to that point where everybody is asking more questions wants to have more eco-friendly um, and the companies are then therefore investing more and more in modernization and especially also these with more people having by regulation because those let's say the chrome 6 or the hexavalent and chromium regulations are coming down so much that tanneries are more and more forced to go away from chromium tanning and then looking at the alternatives you will eventually end up with a leaven leader um, and then going into a modern way of tanning that's um that's very interesting so how big is it now like what's the response from the tanneries your tannery partners or the retail brands you mentioned the hugo boss i heard it too when i was looking into um, some of the tanneries you sent me for their production and they also told me hugo boss is um, committed to using olive and leather for their i think garment lines and they're supplying them now and what other brand partners um, join the join the the movement and and what's the feedback from them and the consumers if if you guys have any to share here i mean there are already a couple of brands we're working with um you can see for example bmw one of the first customers basically started with the i3 put in the i8 now in the ix so they basically like it so much that they have step by step putting it in the lines um the so they're group, still using it they they, they are yes. not trying it or anything they you they used it and they continue using it absolutely so they had it on the i i3 everybody knows that has stopped meanwhile which was maybe a little bit ahead of its time and this then this kind of, let's say a sports car the i8 had it um also stopped meanwhile and then they had a said okay what, what shall we do next they had this ix coming up so this electric suv somehow we got through that also into these electric cars um but also then looking to the volkswagen group for example they've got a little bit some in the audis um skoda using it on the enyaq um, nice car i'm driving it myself of course in a even later um but then also porsche in the taycan so the electric car using it volkswagen on the touareg so different lines they have it in there um i think step by step more and more OEMs on brands are coming onto it. If you look to the fashion um, industry, Hugo Boss, one of the first major or the first major fashion brand actually taking it on board. Um, we've even been supplying out of Reutlingen for sneakers in different colors. Um, now, especially for the garments, it's being used. And um, companies like the, the Red Bull fashion label, Alpha Tauri is using it, Armani. So all sorts of brands step by step getting into it. Um, some are shouting it out quite loud. Some are rather quiet, quiet yet testing. increasing step by step, of course. Well, I mean, they have it on their regular lines. I mean, Hugo Boss, we have it in, in there since about 2018, 2018, 2019. And, but also then looking, for example, to the tanneries, you know, for example, um, um, Horween, yeah. US tannery, very yeah. old one. Um, not only that, they have now introduced their their um, Chrome Excel in Oliven later on the last last independent they showed that, but also they are making for Patagonia for their workwear boots based on the American bison. Um, 
They had Hobin is tanning for Patagonia their own hides. So they have got their buffalo jerky. And at some point, those guys said, hey, what, what shall we do with the hides? Actually, we are throwing them away. That's wasting. Um, and they approached Hobin and said, then you have, with your mindset, the logic next step then would be if, then it has to be your leading data. So if you go and check on, on Patagonia, the workwear boots, that's your leading data, for example. Also Maybe I should get there. one to, to, to dissect here. <laughs> You would be, for example, um, very fortunate if you could get some in my size, they're always sold out. You're, they're really hard to get because, of course, it's only a limited number of hides they then have and then, then make them into the boots and normally they're quickly sold out. Yeah, but if you can get some, uh, I'll check. would be lucky you. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> maybe, maybe, so, maybe they sound want us. Yeah. So it's... Tanneries across the world using our technology, whether it's in the US, whether it's Mexico, India, different countries in Europe, um, for all sorts of different brands. Um, also upholstery, if you look, Vitra um, are doing the full switch at the moment. They're already at 50% of their leathers being on even later, so that's really nice. Like, you know, this Emus lounge chairs are such, such um, products, really nice stuff. I see. Well, you so know, especially I mean, is... at the moment, um, yeah. we see a strong pull, especially from the handicraft people. So the, the leather artisans, all those who really celebrate leather, who know um, leather compared to, let's say, the technical synthetics. So I want to have something durable. I like working with it. Um, and they are more and more getting into it. And that's why, I've got, of course, people buying at Halloween, buying at Moran Giles, buying sorts of tanneries in Europe and India, um, who really love leather, um, but especially who understand the difference. And it's like you are normally explaining how is it tanned, how is it performing. Like you just said, olive leather actually feels like chrome tanned leather. Yeah, um, and I've learned that that actually is something good. Uh, if it looks, touches and feels, except for feeling more warm, um, like, like than a chrome tanned leather. Right. So definitely I can attest to that all the samples here. If you don't tell me like this is um, not, you know, olive and leather, uh, I would say this is chrome tan and they can't be vegetable tan. That that will be my feeling. By touch, you can immediately tell um, vegetable tan from chrome tan, but this is quite different. So anybody um, getting into leather craft or already doing some stuff and like the experiment, really cool articles here um you can reach out to me uh, i i got some tanneries from thomas already and and i got some samples i've seen especially in the american market where we like this rustic natural finishes you know minimal where we see the grain you know that scratches and patinas there's quite a bit of good articles in my hand now um i'm gonna start experimenting with just like your other brands you mentioned uh, we're gonna have a line in pegai soon um made with olive and leather to try so i'm, I'm working on it looking forward and to see that yeah how, how scalable is the technology at this point because you know chrome makes probably more than 80 percent of the leathers in in the world today right uh, and that's big amount like there's a lot of leathers we produce every day and that's a lot of tanning can olive and leather replace this slowly or how quickly is it possible to scale up in production if demand occurs and that actually that's a good point um, and that is the point where where also the colleagues at the time said this really is a solution for the leather industry if, if the leather industry is, is open to it and want to wants to make that transition to a more sustainable future the byproducts of olive growing are available in such an a vast quantity just to give a number the leaves, if we would use the leaves only, which happen to be available year after year after year, simply from shaking the tree for the olives or pruning. So like you would have on the classical, let's say a cherry tree, apple tree or so that at the end of the season, you have to cut some branches and grow some new branches. <coughs> they are healthy as it's blossom, more fruit. So that's what they do with the olive trees as well. Every about second year. And... If we would use the leaves only, 
we could cover already today 40% of the global leather production, which is more than 700 million square meters of leather. But also covered by our patent is the use of the other byproducts of olive growing. So also the pumice and also the black water or the olive mill wastewater. Um, not to compare with other olive mill wastewater people out there who are trying to simply take it and put it in somewhere. It's not the way how it then really works. So they have to add in some other synthetic tanning agents, um, whether it's a glutaraldehyde, formaldehyde based stuff or other not nice chemicals. Um, the way how, how we have patented how to use it basically is extracting it, preserving this oliropein, using it, that it works for the tanning. And if we then use the other byproducts, like the olive mill wastewater or the pomace, easily we could cover 100% of the global leather production by, with byproducts of olive growing. And these are trees which are normally growing in scarce areas along the coastlines in hot regions, whether it's southern Spain, um, Tunisia, Morocco, Turkey, Greece, all along those coastlines, you normally need some warm region. Typically, there's not much rain, a little bit windy as well. And those, that's the areas where, where you normally find the olive trees. They're there anyways, because not much else will grow there. You know? um, other plants, you would need special watering and all that. The olive trees grow, grow quite, quite freely. Um, so and, and seeing that, of course, today our market share is 0.03%. 0 0.03. Yeah. So it's fairly small if you see that. So it's far right. away from a mass product. Right. You could say for the tanning industry, it's lab scale. But of course, the, the potential there is huge. And I mean, it would only need if the brand it basically needs the brands to say, yes, we really want to move into a more sustainable future. And of course, they will not switch from today to tomorrow. It's always a transition phase. And that is the point which is fairly easy because you then simply have to see, okay, in which next region will we build the next extraction plant, um, where is a nice, good availability, and then you could easily spread it across all the Medi across the Mediterranean region. I mean, you would also even have some um, olive trees in, 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 in the regions like Argentina or California, where you have this kind of similar climate to the Mediterranean. And so, so it's easily scalable, mm -hmm. pulling up such plants. I mean, it costs, of course, money, but if you get to a certain um, industry, Demand. Or industrial level, um, this will simply be able to take off. Yeah. Right. And no, that's, talking, that's for example, what, what, what does 40% of the global leather production mean? If you like today, mainly use, for example, the leaves, well, that would be 100% automotive, 100% aircraft seating or trans and transport. It's 100% um, upholstery to furniture. So mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Garments, accessories. Because 60% of the global leather production prim primarily goes into the shoe. So basically, if you would say, okay, let's not do shoes, but everything else could switch with the, with the leaves like we're using today. Yeah, and that is just to give a number, and that is how the global leather production is kind of spread. <clears throat> but with all the other byproducts of olive growing, there's, there's a huge potential. Yeah, for and that's why I, th I think it's a, a, a great future also for leather. Um, if if they decide yes, let's bring push it more into a, a sustainable future. Let's use those byproducts. It's available. That's really um, very promising. It just gets me excited for, for whatever reason. So you said 700 million square meters global leather production. Is it per year? I didn't know no, that, that data is before. 40% of the global leather production would be 700 million. Oh, 40% is will be 700. And that's per year, right? That's per year. So it's about, I think, right. 1.6 billion square meters a year per, per year okay well i didn't know that. i'm just taking some notes and it's impressive that just leaves alone can uh, take care of that much tanning and 
in other scenario right now, if you don't make anything with them, what happens to the leaves? What do what do we do with the leaves now? Like what know. happens to typically they burn them? They burn them. Yeah. A couple of people are now using some for cosmetics, but I mean that's homeopathic numbers, what you would need. Yeah. Um some are seeing maybe you could use such an extract as well as in, because it's very strong antioxidant. It's a couple times stronger than vitamin C. So, of course, it's very healthy. Um, and also, for sure, a reason why the people in the Mediterranean suffer less from certain illnesses or disease compared to the more northern countries, let's say, who are simply only now more and more getting into using olive oil. For the Mediterranean people, whether it's in Italy, Spain, Turkey, it's just standard to use olive oil. My grandmother, she, for her, it was more or less exotic to work with, to use olive oil. She was using maybe rapeseed oils or all sorts of stuff, which for younger generations like me today would be rather exotic. For me, it's normal to use an olive oil. And therefore, it's also a very strong growing aquafood sector. It's one of the strongest growing aquafood sectors with about 3 to 4% growth every year. You know, so where they, for example, nice. even taking down... Um, orange plantations and planting instead olive trees because they see that's a much stronger demand there and the trees much more hard wearing. That's, that's interesting as well. And I want to get into that healthy chemistry side of the olive, olive tree. I know olives was always, you know, just a healthy uh, symbol of food. Like in, in Turkish cuisine, it, it's a big piece. Like every morning we have in the breakfast, we use olive oil to everything and all that stuff. And I believe there's um, benefits to it. And olives are used in so many other places, as you said, like skincare, the, 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 the makeup industry and all that stuff. So you mentioned this to me before and you sent me some samples, the drinkability of the tanning agent you guys make, which was way surprising. I want to talk about that. And the product extension of tea bags you guys did, which I'm drinking the tea right now. It's I'm experimenting with it, by the way, since last week I did a stronger batch last week. It was quite like tannin heavy. I, I felt it in my tongue and then today I made a lighter batch. It's super refreshing, by the way. Can you talk about this a little bit more? So it gives a little bit more perspectives of how healthy it is that we can even eat and drink it. Yeah, absolutely. So. Today we're producing in Germany under food conditions, which is of course another point, of course, making it more expensive than it would have to be. But that's simply for the, let's say, small quantity what we need today, um, what what makes sense, and not didn't really make sense to to set up a, a whole new production somewhere for a couple million euros. Um, but why are we showing that with the tea? Well, basically because the process of making our tanning agent is like brewing a tea. So you, you would take olive leaves, dried olive leaves, or you could also use the fresh ones, but in order to be able to store them and to have safety stocks, we use the dried leaves. The next step in production would be to actually cut them. So you would cut them into a fiber, like for a tea bag. So like if you have got a more more and more possibilities for the water to access the leaf and to basically... That's, what is tea making? The tea, brewing a tea is extracting all the, the positive um, um, parts or ingredients of, of a leaf, whether it's from a peppermint or whether it's from, I don't know, rose hip, and in this case from olive leaves. Um, you want to have the, the, the positive ingredients coming out. Um, and basically then you brew it like, like you showed, I also have the Turkish yep. glass. Um, Using the Turkish yeah, glass, yeah. The... Yes, cheers. <laughs> cheers. You, you brew the tea, but you can see it's a very light color. And But of course, if you would use that and sell that to a tannery, I mean, they would say, these guys are completely insane. They're shipping around water with a little bit some olive in there. Doesn't make sense. <laughs> so what, what, the, what we then, of course, do is, is that, okay, in what conditions can the tanners work with it? Making it into a powder like a classical vegetable tanning agent, we said, doesn't really make sense because the amount of energy you need to come from a, a, a syrup or from a water-based product into a powder, um, you need so much energy to later in the tanning process add water again to make into a syrup or 
that is. Um, it makes sense. So what we then said, okay, we're going to take a different approach, more this cradle to cradle approach. We we'll make a syrup. So this is more or less the final syrup after the tea. It looks, of course, much much darker. Yeah, I'll do that here. It's a nice ta tasting. Then this this syrup is so healthy that you could actually drink it as well. Of course, it's like okay, when you make. Well, I, I know you mentioned that before that it's drinkable. I didn't open the, the one you sent me. Well, I'm gonna drink it so too. A, you know, and I, a yeah. Cheers okay. again. Cheers again. Hmm. Right. It, it is like a syrup. It's intense. Definitely, I can taste the tannins. That yeah. That shrinking feeling of when you drink a, a, a black tea that's super dark and intense, you know, that how it shrinks your tongue, it uh, gives you that stingy feel. That's basically tanning your tongue. That's what's happening in the, in the intense tanning environment. And I feel this a lot. So, but yeah. to be honest, you know, I would never think about drinking a tanning agent. Of as course, being never. In the tannery before, you know, as a person who doesn't want to die, who, who don't want to die. And that, that is the point why we actually introduced the tasting, because we said a classical tanning agent, you would actually never dare tasting. I mean, the tanners in the, in the past, the classical batch tanners, the, the, let's say the old, elder generation, they were still used to basically taste from the pits and kind of know, okay, this is about that concentration and the heights will probably need a couple more, whatever days or weeks or so. Um, but they were kind of, they knew what they were doing. You would normally, if you see a chrome tanning agent, which is that blue grayish powder, you would not dare tasting it. I mean, it would not be healthy anyways. Looking to synthetic tanning agents like in glutaraldehyde, for example, it, you would commit suicide and really would not be comfortable. Um, there are for sure nicer ways to die than that because it's completely, it'll, it'll destroy you. Yeah. Um, so you would also not do that. Yeah. But when I talked to the colleagues in the beginning, I said, hey, Stefan, you say it's Cradle Cradle Gold certified. It's got a material health platinum rating from the Cradle Cradle organization. And you guys, for the skin, you, the colleagues even sent it to, to Derma test, which is a skin sensitivity test. You would normally have um, creams for the face, shampoos and so on, tested according to Derma test to be sure that after cleaning your hair, you still remain with the hair and so don't get a rush or so. So they actually had the tanning agent te tested because they knew it's so pure. It's basically olive leaf tea or olive extract concentrated. Um, and is it, despite being so concentrated, still healthy? And we just re we did it again because we said, okay, we want to still know, is it still the case? Is the test maybe adjusted? No. And again, we, uh, we achieved the excellent ratings or the highest rating. So it assures us knowing that it really is a healthy product. So even people working in the tannery, you could say they get nice skin. And we used to have a colleague um, now retired who used to work with synthetic tannings. Um, he had a, like, a really heavy neurodermatitis rush. Um, he was not happy at all with that. And after a couple of years working with us, he had all nice hands again and so on. Um, and that, that is especially the, the difference. It is a new way of tanning, with maybe an, an old idea of using plants. Um, it's healthy. It can basically replace classical leathers by nature. And it's not harmful. So it's a safe product. And if you see people in all sorts of the press, normally only shows the negative aspects of tanning, um, and mm -hmm. people with all sorts of let's say open skin and so on. <clears throat> um, if they would use our extract, they would actually get a nice skin. Yeah? So um, not that they have to pay the, the the owner of the tannery that they are now. We may be working with um, anti-aging products, um, but for sure it's it's a safe way of, of tanning. And, and you know yourself, then 
fewer and fewer people going into the industry and therefore you have less and less skilled people. Um, and they especially, I think, should have healthy chemistry, which is not harmful at all for the people. I mean, nothing should be harmful right. when the people work with it. And this is simply, it's easier. And so if somebody spills it somewhere, so be it. And the interesting <clears throat> part is if you taste it, in the beginning, it's quite bittery because, I mean, it's it's highly concentrated. It's like if you have a tomato sugar, you chop up the tomatoes, you boil them, there's a lot of water, and after, let's say, one hour or so, it's nice, concentrated for a good tomato sauce. Similar to what we then basically do. You've got the tea. Right. And you we boil it down the, for hours. We end up with the, sir with the syrup with a reduced water content of about only 50%. Um, just en enough that the tannery can actually pump it. What most modern tanneries right. do, they pump it, not just pour it in. Um, and and that enables now for the first time to have a, a safe tanning agent suitable for mass production, of course. And the, right. when you taste it, it's bitter in the beginning. You will also taste some sugary matters. Um, so it's like all the, the vegetable tanning agents, there's a natural sugar content in there because technically it would be possible but very expensive to, to take out the sugar. So we are more hydrophilic, which is a negative aspect because you cannot make hydrophobic leather. So let's say army grade boots, um, which must have a special hydrophobic with a more hydrophilic leather, you wouldn't be able to make. Yeah, um, because it would absorb the, the, the moisture more, which in a lining for a shoe, of course, is great because it, it helps for a good climate in the shoe. But to protect from the water from outside, is, of course, is not so good. And then when it gets laid further back to the tongue, you will maybe now experiencing it. It's a little bit spicy. You, yep. you will normally know that if I you am. taste all your extra vagina or the highest grade of olive oil, it also has got this scratchy, spicy part at the back of the tongue. And this is coming from this oliropein. This is the very strong antioxidant, which makes it so healthy. Another positive aspect is it's a, if you make the tea, for example, um, good against high blood pressure, cholesterol, all that actually it helps. Um, and this scratchy, spicy part coming from this oliropein is that what does that natural cross-linking. I see. Yeah, I, I, I feel that after taste it too, not first it's bitter and then a little spicy in the back. Um, it kind of reminds me the first time I tasted beer you know, just way back in the day. And I'm like, who drinks this for fun? And then, you know, I drank it for 25 years, maybe. Um, so I hope it's not addictive. So I just got my first sip. I, I hope I'm not going to have to call you and send me a six pack of Vicks later on. Yeah. I'll be, we can get that <laughs> organized, of course. Yeah, But, but I actually always um, also like that example, if you, especially in Germany, maybe start drinking beer at an early age, Officially at 16, many earlier, I think how can adults actually drink that? And later on, you actually like it. It's like with all wine, people think, how can you drink wine? Later on, you like it. The heavier, the better. Um, exactly. So that is uh, absolutely the case. Yeah. Very similar. And, and wine, in fact, has a lot of tannins in it too. Some wine, especially when you taste it, that bitter taste in the heavier tannin content wines, it's pretty similar to this, what we just did here. So you mentioned a couple more things here. You said hydrophilic, hydrophobic, just to make it a little bit more understandable to people who don't know the technical terms, basically waterproof, water-resistant leathers versus non-waterproof, non-water-resistant leathers. So it, in a sense, olive tan leather, one of the shortcomings is we can't make um, waterproof, water-resistant leathers due to the nature of the tanning agent. Am I correct? Not yet. We're working on that, of course. <laughs> but tech, tech, not to, to say too much, but technically, of course, yes. Um, being more hydrophilic, um, we can, it's possible to achieve, let's say, an optimized water drop fastness, but that hydrophobing, so far, the only technologies which really work are especially the chrome tent leathers or the metal tent leathers. They have got this metal shield and the, and the best performing one typically is the chrome tent leathers. And, and that is also why you normally find that the main major hiking boot companies um, would normally use um, metal or especially chrome tent leathers. 
interesting part on the other hand if you look to what Horwin are doing with Patagonia of course they cannot use it like that so there they simply accept okay there is certain certain shortfall I mean you can work with waxes and so on to a certain extent to give it some improvement but knowing okay it cannot achieve that but it's still for them enough to say yes let's do it like that I mean there are a couple shoe companies out there meanwhile who make nice shoes also let's say a little bit more into the workwear boot style and so on but who say yes I'll accept it fine I cannot do the typical waterproof but nevertheless I can make nice shoes um, right which will be hard wearing to a certain extent so one follow-up there in the shoe usage um, I know the the sweat from the the feet especially when they're closed in the shoe makes a little bit of detanning uh, during the process so how does this work for olive tan leathers does this also a problem in olive tanning that the sweat content uh, coming from the feet starts detanning the leather causing it become less durable and mold or or putrefy later on you would so from by the experience we have an experience that suddenly there would be mold or stuff like that that not um, and especially actually you would have from being vegetable tanning um, this kind of natural protection anyways there um, to really do that detanning, you would need to have a, probably a really heavy sweat. Um, you can optimize some things in the process, how, how you basically then, how, how well you fix the tanning. Um, another point being a strong antioxidant is oligopein. It of course helps also for the oxidization. So also what you see how, how the leather then changes over time. Of course, there will be a certain, let's say darkening, um, and all chrome free tanned leathers typically in the shoe can become maybe a little bit let's say stiffer over time mm -hmm. um, but a detanning or so I've never come across that um, okay. or even later um, so personally not darkening... in my shoes and and the brands whom we work with nobody has complained about such such happened so far it. Okay, that's good to hear. How about the darkening? Normal vegetable tan leathers tend to oxidize with air and the light exposure, so they get darker into a, like a reddish brown tones, no matter what color you start with. Does this also subject for the olive tan leather? No. Um, can be good, can be bad, depends on whom you talk to. We've, we've talked to, to brands who said, I want to actually have this effect. So they make this, let's say, light orangey or light brown tanned, typically veg tanned, let's say a briefcase. Right. Um, and they want it to turn dark. So even in those, right. even pro, um, promote to say, hey, put it into, your, into the window for two days and it'll turn dark. Where does that come from? It comes from the oxidization. Of typically of the fat yeah. liquors, who will then have got an effect on the on the, the wood content, and the ones who to darken very quick are normally the ones like using oak or especially the cabaccio, um, which is the typical batch kind of contents what the people like to use. In our case, being a very strong antioxidant, um, this doesn't happen like that. Um, so brands who want that to happen, we, are, we will not be the right choice um, because with this strong antioxidant, it of course help prevents much longer, buffers for much longer time um, that the oxidization will happen. Plus, normally in Odin later, we try that, that companies don't really use, for example, quebracho um, and so, such plants. Um, because simply the, the trees have to grow for a very long time. Some are already trying to do the reforestation much much more than in the past. Um, but nevertheless, it's a tree which grows for about 100 years and then you chop it down. Um, and so that's why in the, the most of even letters, you shouldn't be finding this effect. There will be some darkening over time, but like you would have with any other typical leather as well. Yeah? So we, whether people are using it on a sofa or for a shoe, um, or in a car, normally you wouldn't find that effect. Perfect, perfect. Thanks for that detail as well. And we mentioned the uh, water resistance aspect. What are 
other, if any, shortcomings of this technology in comparison to other, in comparison to Chrome or Metal Free or typical Wedge 10? Any other thing that, that doesn't match or get to the point that other panic techniques can? The major disadvantage or the shortcoming at the moment would be the price, simply in the way how that it's not produced in such a mass production way, um, which of course limits it to a certain number of, let's, let's say, brands who say, okay, I want to make a difference in the industry. I'll afford myself that in the beginning and I'll offer that to my customers. If you look, for example, Hugo Boss, certain styles, which they're offering not only in Chrome tanning, but also in Oliven later. The Oliven later is actually outselling the Chrome tan leather styles. You know? So it actually is helping and bringing more people um, to, back to leather. Um, so the, I would say it's this hydrophobing, uh, not um, as this hydrophobing part, which is, let's say the main disadvantage. But then on the other hand, um, we can do any color. So it's not comparable to, to any classical batch tanning. We can do whether it's towards the whites, which are difficult anyways, all that for every technology, but bright, vibrant, lemon, yellow, orange, blue, all such colors are possible. Um, plus, of course, the big advantage for the brands, what they then see is they can use it actively in marketing. And of course, it helps the, for the brand awareness. Um, so the, the, the price, what it costs more, which will be somewhere between, depending on the type of leather, between 10 to 30% typically, um, you, they, they see the, the advantages if they use it in marketing and they should use it in marketing, otherwise it doesn't make sense um, for them to invest right. more and have a more expensive product later to sell. Um, that actually, the, the, especially also the younger consumers, like I would say us, or even younger, um, who think, ah, is that the right choice? So much bad press. Actually, suddenly they can read about it. A good example is what Hugo Boss are doing. If you check online or if you look at the garment, um, what they talk about. Um, say, actually, yeah, I have, therefore, a durable product. Like, Delta is always considered to be durable, not, the, not a typical fast fashion product, um, which after a couple of years, it's breaking up and you have to throw it away because it doesn't look nice anymore. No, it actually ages nicely over, over time. And so it helps those brands and that you actually have these love products what the people have, whether it's their shoes, the garment, the glove, um, the bag, which is a companion over time. And the people then know, okay, hey, I've got here somewhere it says with an embossing or something stitched into the into the product. They see, okay, this is Oliven Leder. I like my product and it will be a companion for, for a longer time. That's um, that's great. Um, <clears throat> and are there any other innovative ways to tan leather, just like a living leather that you're aware of these days, outside of these typical things we, we mentioned and most of us know, vegetable, mineral, um, I mean the wet whites and the chrome. Any other thing that is as innovative or sustainable in the development or in early stages do you know any alternatives? Real alternatives, no. Um, there are a couple are trying to use certain other plants which maybe have a similar effect, but the, you will always then get to the point, the scalability. Um, there's always a limitation in availability of, of certain plants, or you would have to grow them instead of food. Um, so from that point, no. Um, the way how others are trying to use other byproducts of olive growing, like the olive mill wastewater, actually covered by our patent, but they're trying to use it maybe in a different way, adding in synthetics again. Trying to use, let's say, a similar story, but of course it's not, you know, because you then again actually cause a damage to the leather industry by not doing a real wedge tanning, but doing a synthetic tanning and kind of hijacking olive. Um, and um, the, so, so other plants are trying to be combined in the whole process, which is of course good and doing FSC and uh, also so, such ratings um, to basically then be combined later. But in looking to it from an actual standpoint where we can replace the pre-tanning, so instead the point where we really, instead of doing the chrome tanning or the, the the, map, the synthetic tanning with the glutaraldehyde, which is now being banned in the European Union, by the way, because it's mm -hmm. considered health 
and, and danger and da dangerous for the health. Um, so to really replacing in such a way, like like with our patent, whether by green technology for even later the pre-tanning, there's no technology out there which can really do that um, without adding synthetics in there. Um, and then in the next part, looking into the availability, which is available, like I said, with all the byproducts of olive growing to really make a difference if somebody wants. Right. Unfortunately not. I mean, it, it would be great. And we've seen in the beginning, we were kind of the, um, the outlaws out there coming up, having a new technology showing, hey, there's a different way of doing it. Even we are auditing our customers, the tanneries, because we want to ensure that it's done in a, in a safe way, in a clean way. So that if you with Pegai decide, I want to have a leave later, that you can be assured those tanning partners are really following those rules. Um, and, and meanwhile, it's more and more coming up to with all sorts of technologies trying to, to do something in that way. Um, and because they cannot buy us, they try to come up with some other solutions. Um, but there's no real solution other than that at the moment. Yeah. But maybe in the future, I mean, it would be great if they're yeah. more helping. Of course, if all all of us trying to improve and, and do things better, um, maybe someday someone else will come. But at the moment, this is a great promise, promising, and it, it is practical, you know, it's in use. That's the great part. It's not in theory or a concept. Um, it's something I can touch, you know, it's something we can, buying the market now for brands like Hugo Boss and BMW is using these. So it's, it's big endorsements. And especially with the, the shifts in the market, the consumers, the trends, um, I think the Gen Z, the ever gaining power in the economy today, um, they're more conscious. They care about these sustainability who makes my product, you know, what's the impact, uh, what do we do to environment by making this? They ask these questions, which makes me very happy. Uh, they care about the story behind everything a lot more than any other generations, I believe. You know, they are much less uh, allured by the, the marketing and fluff and flashy lights. I think they're just seeking deeper meaning behind things. And their different philosophy sets the trend in the market today so those trends make an impact on tannery industry make an impact on fashion industry and all the ways the economy works because now um, nowadays young people becoming more and more powerful as they start making money you know grow into their careers they will be the rulers of the decisions all around now so where do you see the tanning industry and leather industry going towards in the next 10 20 30 years with these um, with changes um, in the horizon? I think it'll, there'll be a bright future for the leather industry, in fact, because more and more people are becoming aware um, that basically what, what the tanning industry is doing is doing an upcycling. As long as the people are eating meat and whether we like it or not, the, the number of people eating meat is increasing, especially, let's say, um, in, in countries where they maybe used to eat pork in the past, as soon as they can afford, they are using eating much more beef, for example. Um, where pork skin, depending on what you eat from from a, from a pork, you also eat the skin. You know? So there's not so much available, um, which is also fair enough to do, of course. Um, but as, as soon as you have a, a hide available or skin available, and instead of throwing it away, you should do something more. It, whether it's from a cow, whether it's from a sheep, whether it's from a goat, whatever it is, what you eat, you should use it. Um, like with, if you, let's say, catch a fish and you will also normally eat the, the, the skin you know, if you have a nice barbecue. And, um, and also with those changes we see in the industry towards more and more sustainable solutions. So it's not only us in, in the, on the tanning side, but also let's say on the retanning side, more natural fat liquors, other retanning agents coming from nature. Um, dye stuffs, finishings based on biopolymers for the automotive industry. So there are many, many changes going on, which I think is the right move. Um, and also proud, of course, being part of that whole transition um, to see that 
and we don't have to continue what we've been doing in the industry for for decades now um, so now is a, a change coming and especially like you said the people are becoming more and more aware and that's what we see also especially with the leather crafts people um, celebrating leather i mean you're a good example for that um, because you're celebrating the natural leathers, not the, the heavy finished ones. Um, actually, when you do your your breakdowns and with the acetone, and you want to see what is under the finishing. Ideally, there's no finishing or only maybe some wax and you can actually see the beauty of, of the, the hide. And we just checked today with the colleagues in the tannery who saw some skins completely or hides full of scars. You could tell probably that animal wasn't happy um, at all if it was so, so scratched. Um, but in the end, normally, let's say the top fashion brands would not dare using a hide full of such natural markings. But basically, it's right. how the animal has lived. You should actually take it and celebrate it um, because that is the beauty of, of nature. And if it was an animal having had normally then also maybe a good life and, um, and especially also the movements regarding animal welfare. I mean, that is so important um, and also bring not driving away the people from leather, but actually bringing them in um, because they can now ask where is it from and most of, of the hides and skins worldwide are able to be traced. And of course it's some work you have to do, but typically it's possible. Um, and with all those changes, I think there's a bright future of leather, especially with people becoming more and more aware that what is the alternative? Throwing them away doesn't make sense. Um, but for example, using, trying to avoid leather and using synthetics, which in the end, at some point will end up as microplastic also doesn't really make sense because everybody's talking about plastic causing microplastic in the end, when it breaks down, it ends up maybe in, in the sea, the fish have it in themselves. We eat the fish. It comes back in the cycle to us. So in the end, we are harming ourselves. And with that, I mean, WWF a couple of years ago had in a, in a big um, investigation to show how many millions of animals die in the sea every year of plastic. I mean, to say I'm avoiding animal skin and using a PVC based product or whatever, um, such synthetics, which after breaking down after a while cause microplastic, um, that cannot be a solution either. Um, so I think with that change in mindset, and awareness, I think the the movement of, of, of especially younger people at the moment to actually question where does it come from, who made it, um, and also all that work from those leather crafts people who actually do it. And I mean, that's why there's so many at the moment starting that business because they see simply, they see the need themselves, they want to make the difference themselves, and also they find other people, customers who like what they are doing, appreciating the work, would have come probably like 20, 30 years ago, th those people were dying away because there was not that everybody was in fast fashion and so on. It has to be cheaper and and cheaper and cheaper. Um, so, so the tanneries were eventually dying away. Those handicraft people were dying away. And now we see it's kind of coming up again. Yeah. And you can see with also companies like MS and so on, I mean, they're putting up more and more workshops. That's not cheap stuff. Yeah. Um, so they at the luxury end are doing their part. And then the, the people in between making nice shoes, belts, bags, and all that are, are contributing to, to that transition for the consumers and together with the consumers. And especially the work like, like what you're doing, I mean, that is so super important yeah, that has to be done more and more and more yeah, that the people who really want to understand how is it made, what is it made of, um, that they can be, that they are educated by, by people like what you're doing, um, that they have the, and every time you have a new broadcasting, something new, I'm with that, my wife and I are celebrating and also to see, yes, see, this is maybe cheaper. Than the top luxury one, but actually the leather is a much higher quality and the, the handicraft is much better done. Yeah? Um, so actually why pay so much money? And yeah, you, you leave always a choice for the people. That is so super important and it's highly appreciated by, I think, from, by, by the consumers. All right, well, thank you for the, the comments. And that's the whole point here. More and more I talk to 
uh, experts in this podcast, I learn myself. Leather industry has one problem that is being too mysterious so far, being not open and transparent to the public so far. And that gave an opportunity for people um, to attack leather with um, unsupported um, claims, like animals are being killed for their skins, um, leather industry is polluting the environment, it's irresponsible, it's not sustainable. So because this uh, transparency and openness was not coming from tanner industry leather makers people believed or heard those things and maybe they say maybe it's true I don't know so there is this cloud around leather but more and more I learned this this is a problem of transparency if, if we start exploring and unveiling just opening the curtain and showing people what is leather it's it's a byproduct of the meat industry and how it is upcycled by tanneries you know how it's a durable and versatile material that can be made into things that will last so long time in so many different fields and applications of life that we can celebrate. So we don't need to produce other plastics or fabrics uh, instead, which we will repeatedly buy because they're not going to be as durable. So leather is such a big resource and that's why probably it made its way until here as a luxury product you know, thousands of years, but these days it's going through a, a crisis of information or marketing, lack of marketing from the leather makers. So my goal is to help with that a little bit, help people understand it and open that curtain and see through what's going on in the leather industry so they can experience this beautiful resource better um, in, in the way or shape or form they like, you know, from high-end luxury brands or you know, the cheaper or local artisan, whoever they, they choose to. So that's the goal. And I really appreciate all the efforts um, you guys doing by trying to find more sustainable, healthier, better ways to tan leather or different ways. You know, maybe chrome is never going to go away to the point that we, we think for, for various reasons. But again, now we have an alternative and we will explore, experiment and see what happens. Everything that adds value that they will stick around and grow. So I truly appreciate, you know, you and your team there for doing this, providing this alternative, better alternative potentially to us, to the leather industry. <clears throat> and I want to ask one final question here after listening to the, the conversation so far, maybe some makers or crafters or hobbyists, or brands might want to experiment with olive and leather. Where do they find it? Which tanneries? How do they access? If they want, they can reach out to me directly. I got some of the contacts so far. But where do they find those contacts? How do they reach to those people as makers and brands? And the second part of that question, where the consumers um, can look for olive and leather? Or how do they search for end user products made with this technology? Yeah, thank you very much for for that question. Um, first of all, they should always question what is it made of? Is it oliven leather? So it it is globally branded as oliven leather. It's this, if you look for olive leather, like some people would do, you will always find a leather in an olive green color. So it doesn't make sense typically that is then chrome tanned or with some other technology. So oliven leather, being globally branded as such. Um, is used by companies all over the world. You will find some on, so for the, the leather craftsman and so on, you will find such tanning partners on our website at olivenleather.com. Um, for the people who actually want to, exp so there are some tanneries there, there are some leather traders there who work with various partner tanneries. Um, <clears throat> and there are companies listed like Horween, like Moran Giles, like Zetinkaya in Turkey, Gen, like Gemini in, in India, Ika in, in Europe, and so on. Um, there are also listed brands as partners on the website on olivenlater.com um, so that you could find, um, basically, you can see which brands are using olivenlater and you could then basically search some are claiming it as such. If you look then for olive, some maybe only look for olive, but typically olive leather, that is the, the, the brand name, and then you should find products. Um, 
Transparency, like you said, I think that is key. Why, and also why being so mysterious, I think you explained it very well. Um, for people like you and me, or there's artisans who maybe are trying to understand better what, how is it made, um, they already have got a certain, or we have got a certain understanding of how it's made. But let's say um, the mother or father who quickly wants to buy a pair of shoes for their kid, um, they maybe will say, I want to have something durable, so I look for a leather shoe. They will go and they will have a look because that industry was kind of always in the outskirts. People didn't really know what to do. I would always say it's a little bit like alchemists. Yeah? They have, take some skin, they make a nice piece of leather, but what actually happens, nobody really knows. And that is the point where we said, okay, actually our Reutlingen facility, where we can do from the oral height to the finished leather all steps, it's a transparent tannery. And we sometimes have even got not only the, the fashion brands coming or the OEMs, but also universities coming and sometimes final consumers or the doubters. So those who say, ah, you will be adding in there something what you're not claiming to do. No, we are not. Like you say, we can do a tanning agent tasting. We can take it from the big thousand kilogram IBC, the container, um, or we can do like that. Um, especially also people will also see we can run a recipe, they can see what we are doing, nothing to hide. And I think that is key for the future of the industry to be much more open. And that is at the moment, I think this transition phase has already started. And those who will not be able to provide certain transparency will disappear. For the very cheap stuff, maybe they will still remain. But at the moment, with all the movements, leather working group and all that, I think in the the next couple of years we will see those polluting guys will disappear eventually, especially then when the authorities close them down. But those who really aren't doing the efforts for a more sustainable future and doing all those improvements, those will sustain. Of course, leather will pro probably not become cheaper. Um, but And also different technologies. I mean, Chrome will always have certain reasons why it'll remain. <clears throat> certain chrome-free or synthetic tanning systems may remain for certain reasons. Vegetable tanning in the classical way will have its certain cake of part of the cake. And even later will have a certain part of the cake. It has the potential to do more, but eventually there will be different players in there. Um, and then it's for the consumer to choose. And, but for those who really want to be sure for the maximum transparency, how is it made? Ask how is it made? Is it or even later? then they can be sure it's done in a, in a good way. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for all the information you shared here and all the great work you guys are doing for the leather industry and environment. Um, I, I hopefully gonna make it to your transparent tannery next time I'm in Germany. <laughs> I was there last year, but I didn't know any of this. So, <laughs> um, I, I have plans to make a form of the content in the travel concept. You know, we're going to travel around and go to this uh, interesting places, innovative tanneries, legendary leathers or things like that. We will explore them in the place in a, in a travel sense. So probably um, your facility will be one of the very interesting stops. So that's in my plans. Um, I'm hoping very to meet welcome. you there in person and we Please. will give a little bit more behind the scenes uh, information to people next time we meet them. <laughs>